Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this uh, workshop, Data Parallel Essentials for Python. Uh, we are doing the part three of the series. And um, as mentioned, uh, we'll be <clears throat> doing the case studies uh, of uh, popular algorithm like k-means and uh, also an algorithm called gpaves, which is sort of a histogram kind of thing. And uh, with that, let me actually walk uh, you through the agenda. So I know we covered this, but you know, for people who are joined fresh, you know, just I give a brief introduction of what is one API, what is uh, one API AI analytics toolkit, and what it comes with. <clears throat> we just briefly introduced to the um, data parallel extension for Python, which is called Number DPEX, and uh, uh, also DP Control. Uh, we walk you through uh, some of the case studies using the number deep X, um, which is k-means and we'll show different ways of uh, sending the k-means algorithm to parallel execution in python right using uh, uh, ng10 kernel decorators we'll also briefly introduce to intel scikit uh, intel extensions for scikit learn um, we did the same thing for pairwise last uh, in the last session using scikit learn and uh, we'll be doing the similar thing We'll be doing a k-means walkthrough using also scikit-learn, including the uh, number deep expert. And uh, we'll also do the same thing with gpaves. The only uh, extra thing we'll be doing is uh, uh, we'll be actually, you know, doing some hardware-level programming using, you know, uh, uh, the uh, private local shared memory, um, shared local memory, and private memory uh, using uh, with this algorithm. <laughs> And finally, you know, we use the tools like Intel VTune Profiler and Advisor and just, you know, look at the, um, you know, behavior of these uh, applications on, uh, with different types of um, data sizes and data sets, right? We'll be doing the hands-on exercises on the Intel DevCloud. So, um, briefly, you know, um, what is the programming challenge uh, currently, right? Uh, in today's data-centric world, uh, each type of data-centric hardware typically needs to be programmed uniquely, right? So there are different languages for different uh, hardware architectures, uh, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and, you know, and there is a uh, whole bunch of different code bases and libraries that you have to maintain. And with this inconsistent tool support, uh, you know, developers have to learn a whole bunch of different paradigms and programming languages, right? So which is a challenge. Right, um, with very little uh, ability to reuse the software. And the solution is uh, one API. So, and the goal of this project is to deliver unified software development environment across different kinds of uh, accelerator architectures. And uh, one API is an industry initiative. And the goal is to deliver uh, um, full not native code performance across CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. And we also introduced to the AI analytics toolkit. And um, uh, if you see the, um, uh, the you know, um, the layout here, right? So the, uh, you got, um, uh, you know, one API industry initiative of the Intel optimization for TensorFlow. Uh, it currently uses Xeon process. We look forward to using uh, one API uh, on different Intel architectures. Similarly with the Intel optimization for PyTorch. Um, and uh, if you see the, the, the machine learning side, uh, we got optimized versions of Intel enabled scikit-learn with a very whole wide variety of algorithms like you know k-means that we'll be um, walking you through, dbscan, k-nearest neighbors. You know, there are, there are a whole set of um, different algorithms that are actually optimized uh, um, have, you know, af after you actually enable the Intel extension for uh, scikit-learn. In addition to that, uh, Intel optimized Python, we, we will be covering the number part here, which is the, which comes as the number DPEX, and um, we'll be walking you through that. Uh, so I talked about we'll be profiling using the VTune profiler. So it's a very, a popular tool uh, 
So one API based toolkit actually comes with the VTune profiler. Um, Scikit-learn and uh, number DPEX, they all come with um, AI analytics toolkit and also as part of the base toolkit. So, you know, um, so it is actually used to analyze your, um, actually your SQL code, you know, DPEX is a, a wrapper around uh, SQL. SQL is nothing but it's, uh, it got the heterogeneous and uh, parallel program capabilities, Kronos SQL it's called. So, um, it's used to analyze uh, the SQL code and also the Python code that uh, uh, we'll be walking you through. It actually helps to find and optimize the performance bottlenecks across CPUs and GPUs. It supports very pro popular programming languages like uh, uh, C, C++, Fortran, Python. It's a very popular tool and you know its production version is actually currently very widely used. And advisor, um, uh, so this is the tool which helps you, you know, make the best design decisions even before you have the hardware. So the first thing we can talk about is the offload advisor, um, where even, you know, you got, let's say you got a serial code and you actually um, off, send it to your offload ad advisor, it actually recommends you what are the best parts of your code, what are the best loops in your code that you can actually send it for parallel execution. It identifies all the most profitable loops and it also identifies the most non-profitable loops so that you don't need to spend time on. Um, and, uh, you know, roof line analysis is another, another uh, good feature where uh, you can generate a roof line chart um, and it actually shows you the uh, performance model, like bottlenecks, uh, it tells you is your application a compute bound application or is your application is a memory bound application. It shows the actual roots of the uh, your memory bandwidth and you know how much more you can actually how what is what the top level roof you can attain. So it shows you the roof and where actually your memory bandwidth is like currently uh, for your application. And uh, the other things are you know. Um, out of scope of this, um, but you know, just a natural vectorization, adv vectorization advisor. Uh, it tells you, you know, um, what parts of the code that actually send for vectorization in your code. Threading gives you the best threading uh, optimization uh, guidelines. Flow graph analyzer, if you got multiple kernels, multiple workloads, right, that you are submitting to a device. So, and they've got a data dependency. This flow graph analyzer automatically forms a graph that shows the uh, data dependency, how the data is transmitted from one kernel to the other kernel. So these are, uh, this is a whole set of, whole suite of tools, which can be very helpful for profiling application. We tune and advisor go together, go together, you start with the advisor and you iterate through the VTune and then, you know, you can generate the VO, roof line analysis, profile your application, right? So it's like an iterate, iterate, iterating thing that uh, can help you uh, better optimize your code. And as I mentioned, right, this is the roof line chart. And if you see, it highlights the uh, um, poor performing loops. If, if this is small, uh, it shows if the, if the dot, dot is nothing but the each dot is a loop, uh, parallel loop execution. If it's a very small loop, it shows what is a perform very poor performing loop. Um, uh, you know, um, and uh, which it can be improved. It actually, uh, it actually. I'm sorry. Actually, the bigger, bigger ones will show will is a poor performing loop that you need to spend time on. Smaller, smaller loop. The smaller loops, smaller size circles. You don't need to really spend much time on. And uh, it, it actually tells you. If you're, you know, um, if your application is a memory bound or a compute bound, based upon where your uh, dot is lying, and to suggest the next optimization steps, which will walk you through a couple of, uh, um, couple of um, roofline chats um, once we actually log into the Dev Cloud. So one important thing, if you want to do the hands-on exercises, um, uh, Intel Dev Cloud is. Uh, 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 is, is the starting point, right? So it's a, um, I told you about multiple uh, bay, like, you know, toolkits, right? Yeah, one API based toolkit, uh, one API um, AI, AI analytics toolkit, you know, you got a whole bunch of software, right? So DevCloud is a development sandbox where 
all the tools are inbuilt and uh, you got the uh, GPUs actually on a compute uh, compute node and actually you know uh, you can just create an account and uh, um, it's, it takes just a couple of minutes time so you just create an account and uh, you know just get started uh, coding starting coding so you get around 120 days of free access and uh, based upon your interest and you know th that can go for extension um, but um, uh, it's a very handy uh, software uh, tool that you can use uh, to actually start uh, writing the uh, writing the code uh, without installing any hardware. So no hardware, in, no hardware installation. Just start get going, create an account, and you can actually you know offload to a device. And um, uh, if you see the link, devcloud.intel.com on API, get started. Hey Bob, can you please post the link in the chat window of uh, DevCloud? Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, actually, I can actually show the DevCloud screen, and uh, you know, so that you know, we can give a little bit of time for people to if they want to create an account. So this is DevCloud. Uh, let me share my screen again. Okay, hopefully you're able to see my screen. So, <clears throat> so devcloud.intel.com, one API gets started. Uh, and I can paste it in the chat window. So once you register, it takes a couple of minutes for you to register. Once you register for DevCloud, you and click this link, you go to the uh, link I provided in the chat window and click on get started. Right, and uh, slowly scroll down. And there is an option for you to um, launch Jupyter Lab. So once you launch the Jupyter Lab, your development environment is uh, up and running. You can also connect through SSH. So there is a detailed instructions for you to actually, you know, um, Created as create SSH uh, created SSH account and login through SSH mode, and uh, because these are like most hands-on exercises with lots of uh, roofline charts and you know lots of analysis, lots of code running hands-on code, we prefer the Jupyter Lab because you know it's more user-friendly and actually it can we can see visualizing easily. We can visualize things on this uh, Jupyter Lab. So once you are here, right? Um, what you do is click on the plus icon, or you can actually click on file, new terminal, right? And um, uh, you can actually, you know, directly use it as a uh, Linux box, right? So, but this is a, um, this is still a login node. So this is, these are not the actual compute nodes. So if you say CL in, CL info dash L, it gives me, right, um, I only got the CPU and FPGA emulation. I don't have a GPU here. So whatever the job we use, we actually submit to a compute node and uh, uh, using QSub command. And actually it submits a job and you know I'll show you once we actually, uh, we are actually running a notebook. And uh, yeah, so once you are actually in the, um, you click on terminal and here, right? So for, in order for you to download the course content, you can actually, you know, go to the GitHub folder. Uh, software. I'll also paste the link where you can actually get the latest uh, material. There is number of equipations and let me also paste this. So I can actually directly clone to my, uh, let's say, you know, I'm here, right? Uh, so I'm in the terminal, so I can create a, my, create a directory. 
Let's see. Uh, temp. And just get so once I clone um, into my local dev cloud um, account, I can start uh, uh, running and working on my notebooks. It's around 150 MB, so it takes a little bit of time, but you know. The, All right, so I got it here and CD. Yep, so you can also go through a Jupyter notebook here. I can actually go, so the one I just downloaded is uh, the demo folder right. and here. And you can click on the welcome.ipynb and all the modules are here. So we'll be walking you through uh, DPPy uh, k means and gpace. So, DPPy k means you can click on pi, and something is, uh, and you can click on ipynb. And uh, so, you can all the you know code snippets that we'll be walking you through. And there is also the other one is gpace, which will be walking through the uh, second module case study that we'll be working through. So please make sure you are you're downloaded this stuff and make sure you're ready, if, you know, to do some nice hands-on exercises. All right, so. So now we are acquainted using the dev cloud and you know downloaded our course content, right? Let uh, please uh, put in the chat window if you got any difficulties and you know um, and we can help you out. Bobby is actually walking, watching the chat window and he can help you out too. So the kernel that see. Sorry. The question about the. I'll get it. So you, you're just using the the standard um, three point eight kernel, right? Yeah, standard 3.8 Python. So let's talk about the data parallel relationships for Python. So the main uh, um, thing that we are covering in this lab, in the three-part series, right? So this is the, uh, it is a suite of packages actually implementing a common per, per parallel programming model for uh, XPUs specific for Python programming. And the packages in Data Parallel Python provide the uh, necessary blocks um, that actually use a sickle, as I mentioned, chrono sickle, which has got the heterogeneous and uh, um, you know parallel program capabilities. Uh, there is a module uh, called uh, DPCTL, uh, which is called DP Control, uh, which brings you multiple sickle Python based sickle Python Python bindings for sickle classes. You can actually talk to a device. You can per year device, you can submit a queue and there are lots of things that you can use. Uh, and um, also the implementation of, uh, you know, the uh, tensor library based on Python array API, right? This is a tensor. Um, and a NumPy drop-in replacement, which is called data parallel NumPy. And um, number DPEX actually is the extension for number to offload to SQL devices. And it's actually the, um, you know, uh, people who are familiar with uh, uh, the GPU programming, right? Uh, this is uh, this actually is a package where uh, you know it. You can actually you know um, do a direct GPU programming, like you know getting talking to the ND range kernels, and you know uh, you can actually get the global IDs, local IDs in the work groups, and you know all the GPU programming practices is uh, is in the number DPEX package. And uh, this comes, as, as mentioned, this comes as part of the uh, one API based uh, toolkit and AI, AI analytics toolkit. So there are two ways actually um, to actually offload pretty ways. One is using the DP control. Uh, and we already talked about this, just to, I'm covering this. So one is using DP control and uh, uh, 
getting the device context and uh, finding a device and offloading device. Or oh, there's another approach called compute follow state approach, which is based on the Python array API standard, where you can actually specify uh, on what device a computational kernel executes. And uh, it actually you know, specifies the, which the computation taking place on the device where the actual memory was allocated. And if you see, uh, the first example, right, is this executed on the default device. I created a DP NP array and uh, executed on the default device, right? And if I pass in the device uh, specifically, um, X is uh, DP NP and creating array and you're passing the device. So the compute follows data approach is here. So wherever the data resides, right, and you pass in the device and it happens on the device. The one thing that can't happen on uh, using compute follows data is you got two data arrays, right? And uh, both are in two different devices. You're passing two different devices, then that's uh, sent say error, that gives the error message. We already talked about compute follows data in the last two sessions. And, uh, uh, you know, you can watch the uh, uh, replay of those uh, if you want to get more details of this. We also covered this, right? There are three three styles of programming using number defects. One is using number JIT, NJIT, which is number JIT, right? Where, um, you know, it's a NumPy style programming. You got NumPy arrays, NumPy functions, U functions, uh, right? Then uh, you just, you know, uh, in, uh, use NJIT function and just use the numpies, which sends for automatic parallel execution. There's some of the ways explicit p-range, explicit loop. So let's see, you can actually call again NJIT parallel true. And uh, uh, here you're actually specifying a for loop. You're sending, you're providing a for loop, but you're actually calling p-range function here, you know, right? Uh, which is actually, uh, this is explicit way of doing and uh, numpies is using uh, uh, implicit way of doing. And the last one is open style kernel programming. And that's what I was talking about, right? This is the advanced programming model. And, uh, uh, you know, if you see in this example, I'm getting the global ID of the X and Y, uh, uh, you know, the two dimensional uh, points. And, you know, I'm doing a, uh, you know, a sort of a atomic CAD. This is a simple example. Uh, GPU style of people who are very familiar with GPU programming can understand this. And we'll be walking you through some of the um, uh, course snippets in that. Right, and uh, we already saw this. So just if I, very fastly, I'll go through. Um, so this is, I'm using P range, right? This is explicit way. Um, uh, this is implicit way, right? I'm, I got uh, numpies in my code. I'm send, calling number.jit and jit. And uh, I got NumPy arrays and uh, it's automatically, you know, if I use, I call the device context and it offloads to a device. The other way is explicit way of uh, kernel programming. Let me switch on my laser pointer. Yeah. And here I got the uh, P range, right? I'm got a for loop here and like passing P range and offloading to a device. So this is the second way of doing things. The third way is the kernel approach, which is, you know, um, I'm importing the number dpy as dpx. And uh, uh, so if you see this particular way of programming, right, this is a common way in the GPU programming. So I got D, I'm declaring a dpy.kernel and I got a driver. This is a very common way of kernel invocation. This is a simple vector addition. Let's say I got a global size of 10, right? And I'm passing in the global size and the default local size. Uh, local, so we'll talk about the group size and work items a little bit in the upcoming slides. But uh, imagine like, you know, uh, uh, imagine like you have a whole, less, whole group of work items which are divided into work groups and uh, this local default size is the uh, total number of items in a work group. But you pass in the global size and default local size and uh, we, you know, we are just uh, passing the variables to this function. And what we are doing is, you know, you're calling the device context and uh, uh, passing to the driver function, which is actually doing a vector addition here, right? We'll look at more advanced uh, topics uh, using k-means how we can do this, right? 
So with that, uh, covering the basics, let's look at the, so the k-means. And you know, last time we covered the basic, we covered the very basics of pairwise from the machine learning, uh, uh, basics of machine learning. Like similarly, we'll do the same, uh, right? So there are, as we know, there are two types of machine learning when it's supervised and uh, unsupervised learning. And um, supervise these, you know, data points which have known outcome uh, we've seen last time, right? And today we'll be uh, looking at the unsupervised learning. K-means is unsupervised learning, and uh, we'll see data points that don't have that have unknown outcome, right? So there are basically two types. Uh, uh, one is called clustering, right? Um, where you actually segment, you know, uh, you're clustering your uh, data into groups. And uh, the other one is dimensionality reduction. Um, so the dimensionality reduction is, uh, you know, it's actually out of scope of this, but you know, what I can, um, it's sort of right, uh, you, you use st structural characteristics to, you know, we actually simplify the data, we actually, you know, reduce the dimensions of the um, uh, data sets, right. So in the unsupervised learning, uh, let's look at an example, right, for unsupervised learning. And uh, clustering actually, you know, takes data that does not have a uh, label and um, it attempts to use the features of the data to determine um, the groups of actually, groups of uh, structures that we need to identify. Right, so we picked a model with un un unlabeled data. We fit a model, right, which contains the parameters that actually create the uh, best groups, right, according to some sort of a measurement. It can be pairwise or any type of Euclidean distance, whatever, right, measurement. And then this model can be used uh, to predict which group the new data points belong to, right. So this is a very common unsupervised learning uh, we know of. So let's actually take a look at an example of clustering. Assume, right, we have uh, many articles of different topics, right? We don't know what topics are and multiple topics. And for each given article, there can be uh, different multiple topics. And um, we actually, you know, don't even know what those actually topics are. So this is unclustered data. And uh, the text of these articles, right, can be used as features uh, to actually fit the parameters. So these, um, the text can be fit as the parameters of model. And this model in turn can then, you know, help determine which cluster actually a new article, a new data, right, comes and it can predict which particular uh, article that it can uh, belong to. And right, uh, dimensional reduction, uh, as I mentioned, is out of scope, but, you know, some example is, uh, reducing the dimensionality. Essentially, you know, you are actually, especially using the images uh, specifically, you're mostly you're preserving the most important parts of the images. And uh, we want to reduce uh, our uh, data or, or dimensions, right? Uh, keeping the important structures in mostly intact, right? And this is the dimensionality. So it's like simplifying the structures. So let's look at the uh, uh, unsupervised learning, right? Uh, here are, so like as an example, right? This example, simple, we just start with some simple use of a users of a web application and uh, on the right, and um, compared with the age. So the feature is age. And if we were to cluster these, right, users into two groups and, uh, right, this is a simple unsupervised learning. Based upon age, we are actually, um, so we got two clusters here, and uh, uh, we'll see how we can actually explore this mathematically. And this is three clusters, so we can see, you know, we're clustering based upon the coloring, uh, we are clustering in three different uh, clusters, similarly five, right? So it just, you know, how we are clustering, it just starts with uh, the basics, and then, you know, uh, now we'll actually work on a example like came in right with uh, two features right first on the x-axis we got age and the y-axis we got income and what we have to 
actually, you know, uh, find is um, how actually we would like to cluster this uh, into different uh, groups of clusters, right? Um, the answer looks obvious, but you know, we have to see how we can get these the, these things uh, algorithmically, right? And uh, k-means is one such algorithm that we can uh, uh, do it. So in this, right, uh, first way what we do is we pick uh, two random points, right? So this is a k is equal to two, which is we are initializing the uh, cluster, cluster centers here by picking two random points. And uh, they're going to be the center of the clusters, which we call, right, um, uh, centroids. And then um, uh, we actually color coded based upon this, uh, uh, how we, you know, how these clusters are named. So here, right, for each cluster, uh, each, uh, which we actually compute um, based upon the color code, based upon the distance or, you know, based upon some criteria, we determine which cluster it belongs to by actually computing the distance, uh, computing distance and getting the closest, right? The first iteration, this is the first iteration. So, and we see the examples are color coded like this. So every point belongs to a cluster, but this is just the starting, right? We are not done yet. This is, um, you know, some, you know, we have to actually do it multiple times and iterate through uh, until all these points converge, right? So the second step is to adjust the points, right? Uh, so we are adjusting the points. So the clusters and uh, so the cluster centers come, to, you know, they change the place and they adjust the places to the new center of the clusters. And if you see the new location of green and uh, um, uh, and the uh, blue circles, right? So we are through the, completed the first iteration. And uh, here actually we see that um, no other point can be assigned to a, a different cluster, right? So this is the uh, second iteration. And once we have started the second edition with uh, our new cluster centers right in place, uh, we'll need to identify again, uh, which cluster each point again belongs to again. And same thing, we continue the same thing and we move the centers to the new center again, right? So we are moving each center to the clusters uh, mean. Now we find that points don't change and these are converged, right? And, um, now each point are belonging to the, uh, each points are belonging to the closest center. So now we, um, we are seeing uh, three clusters, right? And um, there can be other solutions, but uh, we'll look at different types of solutions that we can use for this K-means algorithm. So as similarly, like for two, we are actually, you know, doing the cluster, initial cluster assignment for three points and uh, uh, three cluster points and we're adjusting the cluster group based upon these three points. And what the problem is this, right? That this is actually sensitive to the choice of the initial, whatever the points we are selecting, this is very, uh, you know, sensitive, right? Uh, based upon the points that we choose. And, um, different types of initial configuration points uh, that, you know, we create the cluster centers can actually, um, you know, change our algorithm, right? And it, it can yield different results. So this is called the local, um, local optimus, local optimum, right? And um, the other one is, the other metric that we can consider is inertia. Right, inertia is nothing but you know uh, the sum of square distance from each point to its cluster center. Right, it's sim something like a Euclidean distance. And um, so initially, right, uh, it's a very popular metric. Inertia is a very popular metric to uh, do that. And um, we actually rank the different clustering configurations according to, um, as I mentioned, right, to the uh, square distance. And um, what we are doing is we are actually, you know, um, supporting the more the points that are closer to each other, and we are actually sort of, you know, uh, penalizing uh, uh, that are points that are spread out, right? 
And uh, this actually depends upon um, the domain expertise and you know, there are other metrics that can be used. So if you see, I got inertia here, right? First inertia is, you know, 12.645. And the second one is 12.943. So this is, you know, based upon the inertia values, the points are converging in different uh, aspects, right? Um, the third one is 13.122, right? So there's another way that is called smarter initialization. Uh, and uh, so this local optimum, whatever we're doing, right, often happens when two clusters are initialized close to each other. So, you know, we can actually make an effort to initialize uh, with points that are in actually far away enough from each other, right? So here's uh, start by a random initial point, right? For the second point, pick a, um, instead of getting it randomly, right, what we do is we actually, uh, take a probability, right? Like um, distance squared probability, uh, like the inertia, right? So we pick up, this point can be further because now we are actually got a criteria which we are assigning the second cluster based upon the current cluster distance, right? Which is uh, distance squared to uh, each point. So, you know, uh, we may actually end up seeing the points that are not close, right? So same thing, right? Uh, we weigh the points according to the uh, sum of square and uh, pick up the third point, right? And similarly with the fourth point. So this actually algorithm is called uh, K-means plus plus, which is actually, you know, uh, which actually avoids getting stuck with our local optimum approach, but it's uh, actually common. If I think this is a default one that you, if you don't initialize the k-means uh, in scikit-learn, then this is the common way implementation of k-means. Right. Now that we are familiar with how k-means works, let's ask, you know, how do we choose a number of clusters, right? Which is also a very important point. Um, let's see some examples, right? So. Let's say, you know, we are trying to find a problem for a computer that has got four cores. And the naturally we, you know, we call it as we've got four, uh, we can create four clusters. An example, like a business organization, right? May dictate, uh, for example, 10 uh, different sizes to cover uh, for clothing design, right? So we can pick 10 as K as 10. It depends on the business uh, side of the things. And uh, something, you know, uh, we are actually free to, if it's a random thing, we are free to pick the uh, K, the right number for K. So what we, you know, in this chat, what we are seeing is, you know, we are free to pick the number of clusters, right? But we can still use inertia to pick our K, the inertia that we were talking about. Right, the, which we know inertia is nothing but the sum of the distance square between points and the, each cluster center, right? And we use inertia to compare different configurations of uh, cluster centers uh, when K was held constant. So initially what happens, inertia will most of the time go down as number of cluster, uh, number of K goes up, the inertia will go down. And the optimal thing we see is, the in, that's called the inflection point, right? which can be chosen as a good K until that point where inertia, you know, stops dropping uh, heavily and it's slowly, you know, settles down. And um, so that actually is a law optimal or a logical choice for choosing the K nearest um, the number of clusters. And um, we'll also see the syntax using data parallel essentials for Python. And this is a simple, syntax using k-means uh, for scikit-learn, right? And if you see, I'm importing the sklearn.cluster.import k-means. And uh, uh, so if you want to, I already talked about the patching of scikit-learn algorithms for Intel, there's a complete separate course on the scikit-learn for Intel extensions. And uh, you just, uh, enable the patch using import patch sklearn and uh, patch sklearn and you you know you get the extra uh, intel optimizations uh, of the stock version of the scikit-learn algorithms right and we'll see an example on that 
And um, so we just import this here, right? From SQL and import k-means. And uh, we create an instance of the k-means class and we are initializing the number of clusters. Uh, and it can be k-means plus or random, right? Uh, if you don't leave it as uh, default, I think k-means plus is the default, but you can set it as random and stuff. Right, so we are setting the final number of clusters for this. And um, finally, we feed the instance on the data. For the data we take, we feed the instance on the data and predict clusters for the new data, right? And we use uh, k means, y, is, y predict is k means dot predict of x2. And this is an example that we use uh, to actually uh, import the scikit-learn, uh, Intel extensions for scikit-learn. Right. So before you even, uh, you know, uh, the first part of the code, you will have the from scikit learn ex import patch scalar. And uh, and this next step is right. First step is we are uh, importing the uh, scikit learn and applying the monkey patch. And then the second step is we are actually uh, importing the actual algorithm. Here we're importing the PCA, which is principal component analysis. Right. Uh, this is a simple example. And then you can actually, you know, uh, import the PCA and you can, you know, write the regular code, uh, whatever you write for the uh, stock version, right? Which you get, you know, uh, very good speed up. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's a very good course on, on this. And, you know, um, the second example is uh, k-means. And um, similarly, like what we are doing, we importing the monkey, we importing scikit-learn ex and applying the monkey patch, and then we are importing the desired scikit-learn algorithms like k-means here, right? And then the same thing, right? We are initializing the instantiating the class k-means class, and we are fitting the algorithm right uh, with the data, and then we are predicting using the test data with the. Uh, uh, This looks clustered, but you know, I can, uh, I try to fit in, this is the number DPEX part of using the k-means, but actually I'll walk you through the dev cloud. So if you see, right, the code here, uh, the main parts we need to consider are how we are sending for parallel execution. Actually, I will walk through, walk you through the logic in the, uh, in the dev cloud. But the first one, right, we are actually using either numbajit decorator or the dbpy kernel decorator, right? And, um, uh, using the number JIT, what we are doing is, right, we are actually determining the Euclidean distance from the cluster center to each point, right? And the second uh, kernel that we are passing is, as we mentioned, right, we talked in detail. So we are assigning points to clusters, each cluster, and we are updating the centroids after every computation, right? So we have seen multiple iterations, right? And once we all the points are converged, right? Then uh, what we do is, uh, uh, you know, we settle down, right? So what we do is these are the two kernels that we're passing and then uh, we are passing to the uh, device context of uh, GPU. And, uh, you know, we are uh, offloading to the device. So once we call group by cluster, all these functions are called and uh, and if you see explicit use of P and this is explicit way of uh, handling the parallel programming using the uh, data parallel action of Python. So with that, right, um, uh, I'm just covering the basics of the anti-range kernels because we got GPAs that we are doing sort of a, you know, a, a simple examples that are using some sort of the ND range kernels, we are using the uh, shared local memory, not actually shared local memory, but the private memory, individual memory of a single work item. But actually, you know, to understand what ND range kernel is, you know, if you see this, right, each complete um, is, you know, this is the complete uh, work items, uh, right? The entire, entire iteration space is actually divided into uh, smaller groups called the work groups. So if you see the orange color, this is the work group. And um, work, group, work items within a work group are actually scheduled on a single compute unit. I'll show you the next slide. So each work group will be uh, running on a uh, single subslice that uh, we talk about. And uh, this actually grouping of kernels, right? This is actually 
helpful for low level performance tuning. Actually, you can change the sub, uh, local work group size when you're passing the kernel. Um, and, uh, you know, this is actually helpful for us to, for resource usage and, you know, all load balancing the work distribution between different kernels and stuff. So this is the right. Uh, so if you see, I uh, clearly it's a four by four, four three, uh, three dimensional, right? So, and the RNG is, uh, is a work group, right? It's a, uh, uh, again, it's simple work group that is, you know, showing separately. Subgroups is out of scope of this because number DPEX not doesn't support subgroups yet, but SQL supports subgroups. And the last blue one is a single work item. So this is how the uh, ND range kernels are, um, you know, differentiated and uh, how the parallel executions happen on the ND range kernel. So if you see, right, this is the Gen 11, Intel Gen 11 graphics. Uh, uh, architecture, right? And uh, for example, if you're parallelizing reductions, right? If you're supporting, you're sending reduction to a parallel kernel, right? So each work group executions are mapped to um, compute units on hardware, right? So this is uh, one subslice uh, is uh, almost like, a, it's like a one work group, right? And if you see each subslice got its own shared local memory, right? It's called uh, local memory or shared local memory. And uh, what we can, you know, if you see in a simple reduction operation, but accumulation, it can be parallelized by first, it can send a for parallel execution by first reducing the items you know, in uh, each work group using the endurance kernels. And then, right, each work group will have its own reduction uh, kernel, right? It's reduction value, right? And then all these multiple work groups can execute in parallel, and it actually depends upon the number of compute units and hardware. And uh, so each work group computes its own result and then, you know, use, uh, and uh, based upon the technology you're using, as, uh, if you're using shared local memory, then, you know, uh, there are ways to how you can actually synchronize the data. Or if you use, atomics is one way actually how you synchronize data without data race conditions, right? And um, so this is actually an example, a nutshell, like how, giving an overview of the, you know, how the work items are laid out and, you know, uh, uh, how the shared memory, how, how each work group has got its own local memory, shared local memory, and each compute item, right, it got private memory. It's a single register, which is a private memory. And we'll see in examples using private memory in one of the uh, uh, algorithms. With that, uh, let me actually switch to the dev cloud and uh, let me know if I take any questions here before I... Yeah, there's oh. some questions, but we're tackling them, Praveen. So there's some questions just about uh, the how do you manipulate k-means in higher dimensions? And I, I recommended we could use principal component analysis to shrink the dimensionality before you feed it to k-means, still use the inertia or another thing you could do is use DB scan. DB scan is also optimized for the Intel toolkit. So it's another one of those um, of the gallery of functions that are optimized within the scikit-learn library, uh, the Intel extensions for scikit-learn. And mm -hmm. you can actually apply it to GPUs as well. So th those are just a couple of ways. You could use uh, k-means with PC, uh, PCA, do the PCA first, then P PCA transform data to the k-means. And now you can just begin to visualize the data, particularly with something like Seaborn uh, pair plots. Is great. You can view five, even up to 10 dimensions of data kind of simultaneously in a grid sort of a way. And then you can also use DB scan. So, um, you know, DB in this, you could do the same kinds of things. But, but, um, and our, our course, we go into a lot of this stuff on the, on the scikit learn part of the course. So, if you're interested in that, you know, we'd be game to, um, you know, do a follow on with you guys because we, we kind of go into a lot of this stuff. But there, there are ways to find just like uh, um, we were showing you how to do the inertia to find the, number of, of clusters to specify as a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. There are some other tricks that you can use to find the parameters that you need for DB scan and that we cover that in the course. Okay, I'll set up. Thank you, Bob. So let me switch my screen to DevCloud and... Uh... All right, let me share my screen, yeah. 
So I hope everyone got access to DevCloud and you know you are able to log in and download the course content, right? With that, uh, let me actually you know go to my folder here and um, let me go to the K-means algorithm. So there are two uh, folders here. One is uh, sklearn underscore k-means. This got a way of how you can, uh, excuse me. This got a way of how you can actually use the Intel scikit-learn, uh, Intel Actions for scikit-learn and you know, um, just test out the application using the monkey patch and see, you know, un unpatch that and you can, you can play around with it. We can actually go through that. And um, the other one is the uh, number DPEX of k-means and, um, and we'll see, right? Uh, there are multiple ways uh, uh, that I, that we created the k-means for. The first one is using the uh, num budget, simple CPU. I don't, I'm not even parallel offloading. So, you know, we don't even need to run this. This is just a serial way. And uh, uh, we are not even offloading to device. The other one is uh, implementation of tar K-means, targeting GPU using the budget. And um, this one is also using the NGIT. And then we are actually offloading to a uh, device here, right? The main things I'm, I want to concentrate is on uh, using the number DPPy, uh, explicit writing using the kernels because that's where I'm actually using atomics. I, so if I cover that, I will be, uh, you know, you can imagine, you can think that I also covered the, the previous example because the only difference is you're calling the number JIT here instead of the k-means. Uh, but um, we can actually see, spend more time on the GPU programming side, right? And if you've got any questions, I can actually walk you through that. So the first example, right, this is not, this is the no atomics. Um, so the first one is running the k-means kernel without using any atomics. And uh, I talked about atomics before, but if you see atomics is nothing but, you know, it actually allows if you got, you know, um, multiple work items, right? Um, that, you know, you're working on a reduction operation or uh, atomics is pretty famous in C++, uh, parallel programming in C++ too, right? And uh, uh, without, you know, um, so it can actually, without any data, data race conditions, it can actually apply the reductions or additions or subtractions, right? And the number DPPI supports two kinds of uh, uh, atomics as of now, which is add and subtract, right? And uh, so we'll see an example uh, in this example, right? Using atomics and uh, we'll be updating the centroid of the application using the atomics and uh, so here we are not using the atomics here. If you see, right, these are just, you know, using, uh, uh, these are cal calculating the centroid sums. We are not actually using atomics. This is the naive version of uh, k-means. So the first one is, right, uh, we're calling number dp packet kernel. There are multiple kernels in this. It determines the Euclidean distance from the cluster center to each point. So, right, um, and um, the main, thing in this, uh, this is laid in such a way that, right, um, the, all the iterations, the number of repetitions, these are all, you know, the sent as command line arguments to the code. I can show you an example, uh, how actually this is laid out. Uh, this is actually clearly detailed in this. And um, the command line arguments that take, right, so the first one is steps, right? Uh, how many workloads you want to run? Steps is, uh, uh, let's say I want two to power five to do two to the power of five data size till two to power 15, right? I got 10 steps, right? So I can specify 10 and this sample actually what it do, what it will do is it will run first, the first step, the second step and it iterates, it go on. It's go on, it, it will go on. The initial data size, you can specify the initial data size of this application. So, you know, we can start with, uh, for the demo purposes, we can start with below two power 10 and, you know, for profiling, right? You don't see any advantage when you are profiling your the application, right? We need huge, huge, huge data sets like uh, uh, the data size I tried is around, starts from two, six, two power 16 till two power 28, right? So that big size data size that repeat is we, we talked about, right? Number of repetitions in the cluster. So how many times you want to repeat the same operation? And uh, for some examples, there is a timer uh, for pairwise, we got the data dimensions, right? One, two or three are dimensions. 
USM is the compute follows data approach. I talked about compute follows data approach. Either you can uh, use the compute follows data approach, uh, which is actually specified in the dash dash USM, which we covered last time. And uh, if you don't want to use the compute follow digit approach, you can then, you know, you don't need to send this an argument. So all the examples that are laid out actually are, are following the same syntax of the command. And then I can actually show you each of these, right? Uh, my script files I, and uh, how these are laid out. So this is my k-means algorithm. And let's say I'm running the atomic.sh, right? So I started atomic, so I got steps as five. So it starts from 1024 and each step actually repeats five times and it actually runs five, you know, 10 to two power, 1024 is I think two power uh, 10 probably. Yeah. So two for 10, 11, 12, 13, right? It iterates to five, five times. Uh, all the script, these script files, I, as I mentioned, right? These are actually submitted as a Q script. So on the dev cloud, you got a, we created a wrapper for QSub. So this is the Q script, which is actually sending the code to the uh, compute nodes, right? And if you this is, uh, if you see the main point, the QSub ID, QSub dash L nodes, right? This is the one that actually sends the work to the compute node. If you're offloading to a GPU, I'm asking a GPU here, right? And it's sending to a GPU and um, uh, the script is the actual script file that this actually, um, QSub pushes the script file on the compute node and you get the results back. And we can run an example seeing that, right? So that's a layer, that's a basic fundamentals of how these examples are laid out. So that, you know, uh, you got that, you, got the, you can try out multiple command lines and increase the data size and actually try out and play around with these uh, examples. So with this, right, uh, so this is a, uh, approach we are doing without atomics. So first one is we're determining the Euclidean distance from the cluster center to each point. The second kernel, right? We are now assigning points to each cluster based upon the Euclidean distance. We are assigning the points to cluster. And then the second iteration is we are adjusting the, uh, you know, uh, the, here we are uh, updating the centroids after every computation. So, and, uh, uh, Finally, right? So the final K means this is the actual kernel that we are passing and we have seen the driver, the actual driver, right? So this is the actual driver of the GPU programming, right? And we are passing in the device context. If you don't want to pass in the device context, compute follows data, you pass in the dash dash USM as the option. And it automatically sends the USM. And I can actually walk you through that. And I'm, uh, you know, calling the device context, uh, and I'm calling the. If you see, I'm calling group by cluster, calculating sum one, calculating sum two, and updating the centroids. Right. So all the steps are being performed here, and then we are just printing the centroids uh, of the application. So uh, I can run this application. So click on the triangle, right, and. Um, so what you need to do is you don't need to even worry about all the queue sub commands and stuff because we wrapped everything for you. So you just need to run this and uh, come here and one. Yeah. So you just submitted the job to the queue and uh, I hope DevCloud uh, works properly because it was under maintenance yesterday and you know we ran into some issues but if you run into any issues uh, it actually it was under maintenance yesterday and you know we encountered lots of uh, last minute issues but I, all the issues are fixed but you know sometimes we may see some issues going on here and there it usually takes you know if the based upon the load, like, you know, it actually supports around 120 people, uh, members at a time. Uh, but, you know, it also depends upon the, you know, uh, the time actually, right? Uh, and if you see, the compilation is done and, you know, I got uh, five data sizes, right? And uh, it just it gives a glimpse of the actual wall time that happened. Uh, it's not the complete time that we sent it to the 
GPU node, but it just whatever these actually computation that happened, right? So that is without atomics, right? And the second example we run is using atomics, and we talked about atomics, right? Which without data rest conditions uh, happening, we and uh, you know the additions uh, we actually. Uh, send it to the parallel execution of the device uh, between different, uh, you know, to actually so that, you know, the work items are synchronized properly and there are no issues with the, uh, you know, the registers or the work items overwritten with the data is uh, wrong values, right? And um, so the only difference here is kernel atomic, right? So this, the paid, the calculating the centroid is the same, sorry, calculating the pairwise distance is the same. And uh, if you see, right, calculating the centroid sum, so this is a actually, you know, we are adjusting, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, finding the cluster center points, right? This is the, and uh, I'm getting the global ID uh, for each item, right? And uh, I'm calling the atomic uh, ad, if you see the same example there, right? And we can see the difference here. So it's like adding the, uh, if you see the cluster points are being adjusted and added here using uh, non-atomic code. And the uh, points ascending to the points to the cluster. And here we are using the atomics and uh, the three uh, additions are uh, happening in parallel uh, using atomics, right? And the, uh, this one actually, right? Uh, these are small computations. Actually, I can show you the roof line graph. The main point, main computation is happening in the uh, calculating the centroids here, and uh, these points come as very very small that we can actually ignore. Uh, and the same thing here, uh, right? Uh, I'm calling the driver again, and uh, if you see, I'm passing in the number of centroids, right? Uh, which is the total uh, work group size, you know, actually this is the total number of points. So this is a total iteration space, right? And we are calling the default local size, which is a work group, work group size, right? And, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are passing the three functions with the same uh, syntax, call centroid, right? And if I run this code, the same code, right? So this, we, I started with, we started with the naive version, atomic version, and the next GPS module that I'll be walking you through. I'll show some uh, implementations using private memory. And, you know, uh, because we, uh, uh, in these examples, when we are running, we are seeing some sort of, uh, uh, L3 band with, you know, lots of reuse of L3 cache and, you know, and um, the way how we try to just to give example a solution is uh, using temporal lo like, you know, locality, like uh, local memory or private memory loaded from the private memory and um, talk to the, uh, you know, uh, at a, you know, pick some work items, compute the uh, do the computations, right, and uh, set some barriers. Uh, private memory doesn't need a barrier, but if you have local memory, right? And actually, you know, all the work group sizes, right? Once they are synchronized, then, you know, we actually file, again, we create another barriers and, you know, uh, we actually combine or um, do the aggregation of all these results, right? Uh, and we'll see some examples using GPS. Uh, and this is using atomics, right? And, uh, so we're just plotting the results just to show, you know, the different, we are actually taking 10 clusters and we are just plotting the results in the clusters. So if you see here, the same example, but what we are doing is, which is getting the results uh, and uh, uh, of uh, 10 centroids, and then we're plotting all the 10 centroids uh, in a graph just for visualization. Actually, I ran this. Uh, yeah, it's done. 
I don't know. I actually ran this before the workshop to save some time, but uh, somehow these are overwritten. So if you see, I got 10 centroids uh, here and all the points are clustered around these different uh, centroids, right? So we ran the naive version, we ran the non-atomic version and we ran the uh, atomic version, right? So I just created some uh, uh, Vichun analysis. I already talked about Vichun, right? Actually, you know, uh, we use a VTune to analyze how the application is performing, right? You know, you got lots of metrics of data that you can actually go through. This is only a part of it that actually, you know, you can actually download the VTunes directory folder into your local machine and uh, uh, you can actually open the VTune GUI editor, like, you know, the GUI of VTune and you get lots of more information and, uh, you know, uh, more useful information. But you know, I just created, so I just run this tab. So the one I, let me make it, yeah. So for pairwise, if I remember, uh, we use the, you know, the dimensions as a increase in the um, size of the data arrays so that you can see the difference between how it was performing uh, with a new version to a higher GPU uh, occupancy, right? So this one is just, you know, I can actually say this one actually, if you see just spent 1.6 seconds, which is, you know, uh, and uh, I'm running around uh, 1 million items here, right? Steps is one, I'm just running one time, right? And this is just the naive version without any atomics, the k-means kernel, which is no atomic version, right? And uh, I see some, you know, warnings here saying this is stalled and right. So I tried increasing to, uh, you know, this GPU offload, it gives you the, actually the offload time, right? And it will give you information about uh, what is the EU stall array, uh, what is the ideal time elapsed when the GPU busy, it says 67% of elapsed time with GPU busy, right? And, um, and it also gives you, uh, more information, right? What are the top hotspots available in your code? And uh, so that is the offload part. And there is a hotspots, which actually shows you what are the hotspots in your code. And if you see, right, uh, this is the, uh, it's, it's giving that I got a 10% is not bad, the L3 bandwidth, right? Um, and you see FP utilization is also less, which is good, 2.9% is also good. Uh, but I see lots of uh, EU stalled array because, you know, it's not using any, it's actually accessing directly from the global memory, right? And, uh, you know, uh, so there is sort of, you know, it's lots of cache to use and it's, you know, it's taking a lot of time. The GPU is being idle for a lot of time. And uh, uh, I just increased my, let's say, repeat size to 20, right? And I see a little bit better here. And I got more GPU time now, right? Uh, I spent more time on the GPU. And um, uh, the EU is still there. The EU array in this is still there. As I mentioned, right, this is still not the best optimized uh, code for using the localities and stuff, but uh, I got some, uh, uh, the same L3 bandwidth is not much impacted. So it, this is still good. And if I uh, and if I see what code I ran here, this is actually also the k-means kernel, right? And now I try to uh, increase the size so badly, like you know, repeat a set as hundred, and uh, you know, I got uh, my GPU time is now eighty-five percent. Uh, spent on eight, eighty-five percent time, but I still got lots of bottlenecks in my code. If I see here. Right now it's more, you know, uh, even though it spent more time, it still does, doesn't, it's not happy with the EU array stalling, right? It's still more, our GPU is more ideal and it's giving more warnings here, right? Um, so, and actually I can also walk you through the advisor report and I told you about advisor, right? They can run the advisor here. So this is the advisory, but if you see, right, there are three kernels. Right? If you see, this is the 
calculating centroid sum two, which is you know a big circle here, which we need to concentrate. Uh, you know, if you want to optimize, and this one is you know is a small dot, which is actually updating the centroids, and uh, this one is group by cluster, right? And it shows like you know uh, what's my. It actually is in between compute and uh, it's almost on the border of. If it's towards this way of the graph, it's uh, memory bound, and if it's towards this side of the graph, it's uh, compute bound. But it's actually, it's just on the border. And uh, if you can click on that, right, it shows you, uh, you know, the, the rooftop, right? So it is 55. It's it it says that my L3 bandwidth, it still still can be improved a lot. So I'm actually staying around. Uh, if I see the number. Yeah, so um, I can actually increase, I can actually, you know, um, get a better headroom here, seeing if you see the roof, rooftop, right? It shows you where, where exactly you can reach on the target hardware. And there is a lot of more information you can actually query from the roof line chart. You can, you know, you can go here and you can click on SLM memory, the L3 cache, right? Click on apply and, you know, this is a live chat and you can see all the different types of memory bandwidths that you can actually analyze and see, you know, where, where the bottlenecks are and, you know, um, different types of memory, how, what, how you can improve the latency. And, you know, uh, this is a very good uh, roof line is a famous report that you can actually query and see how your application is performing. So with that, uh, actually I can switch to the next module, which is GPAs and uh, let me go back here. GPAs and uh, let me actually cover the ND range section, right? Um, I'm just covered some basics of the usage of the local memory and, you know, simple examples to get started with. So I talked about ND range, right? So I'm, I'm try, all the uh, entire iteration space is divided across work groups and, you know, all the work items um, uh, will tandem with the work groups and, you know, that's how the ND ranges work, right? And um, so if you see, and we talked about this, right? So this entire iteration space is distributed across different work groups and each work group will have a subgroup, which is anyways, it's not uh, relevant here because it's not it's supported and this is a single work item, right? And uh, if you see each work group has got its own shared local memory and I can show you uh, what this is. So uh, in this parallel algorithms, right? Um, so there will be very high degree of reuse Right, and uh, so for each re reusing, right, we don't actually need to load from global memories and, you know, we can actually hold the values into the shared local memory and then we perform the computation. That's where, that's how actually, <clears throat> you know, uh, accessing this data values, uh, the latency can be reduced. If you, let's say there are, you know, there are multiple ways to continue accessing continuous memories with known values, right, um, and, uh, uh, so each work group has got its own local memory and uh, uh, the advantage is right, uh, the GPU devices, there are actually dedicated resources for this local memory. And, um, uh, you know, they communicate through the local memory. And so once all the computations are done and there will be one final update to the global memory after all the work items are synchronized, but groups are synchronized and within work items are also synchronized, right? And if you see this, uh, so for number DPEX, right? Uh, how you create a local memory is very simple. Just create a local number DPEX dot local dot array, just a array and shape of that array. You just create an array in and using this, this, this uh, syntax and actually you're creating a local memory. Similarly, you create a private memory uh, exactly the similar way. So, and you just, you know, uh, handle that memory and, you know, erase and uh, you're automatically actually, you know, creating a, either a shared local memory or private memory and, you know, actually you're manipulating with that. And uh, yeah, so this is the work group. So this is the global memory, right? And all the 
iteration space, that they can access the global memory. Each work group can only access its own local memory. So this work group can access its own, this own local memory only, this one can access this uh, local memory only. And each data item, each work item will have its own private memory and no other item can access this private memory. So that's how the uh, hierarchy is laid out uh, uh, in a typical GPU. And let's actually look at a simple local memory sample, right? As I mentioned, right, uh, so uh, this one got usage of barrier and local memory. So the first one, right, I'm using local memory and reversing an array. If you see, I'm get creating a array, right, of shape 10 and getting the global ID, right? And I'm actually loading from the uh, global memory, a tile of data from the uh, global memory to the local memory, right? And I'm setting a barrier here. So, you know, until these work items are finish their computation, no other, you know, work item, no other um, kernel can actually, you know, manipulate that data, right? So that barrier, so barriers can be two, either it can be a global barrier or it can be a local group, work group barrier. If you don't specify anything, right? Uh, the, if you see in this uh, barrier, it's I'm saying local memory fence. So I'm creating the barrier for the work group here. If I don't specify anything, it's a global barrier, right? Um, global memory fence. And here I'm just, you know, um, I'm computing some data here, right? Uh, I'm reversing the array and, uh, you know, that took the tile of data and I reverse the array. And uh, finally, right, uh, once this is done, um, so each, after each computation, right, it goes to the other uh, tiles of arrays and it actually, you know, finally updates the data. And actually, you know, this is the, uh, kernel that we are calling, right? The same thing that we are following. And uh, if you run this code, right? I Let me see if this is already run. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Let me run this code and let me see. So it should be nine and nine. And uh, so similar level that is running, right? I'll show you what the barrier support is, right? Uh, this is usage of the barrier. And here we are using the global barrier. And what we are doing is we are just multiplying uh, by two. This is a very simple example, right? So I get the global ID and I'm not creating any local memory here, right? And uh, uh, so, I, you know, I took a, uh, I, I got my data item, I created a barrier and I'm multiplying the uh, value by two until this computation is done, right? Uh, this work item can be accessed by uh, anything else. And uh, once this is this uh, loop exists, right? Uh, we are just writing back the results back. So that's how we are setting a barrier using the uh, global memory fence here. And uh, yeah. So the first one, right? Uh, this is an array, and it multiplied by two. And the second job, it reversed the array, right? Nine, nine, and. Eight. That is global memory usage. Let's look at the private address space. And um, if you see here, private address space, each work item will have its own register. It's a, a, a single register, right? It's a private memory space. And uh, this is also a array style of program. You just create a array uh, using the number DPEG syntax that we have shown before. So here we are creating a static array uh, on the device private address space. Right, so let's. This is the kernel, private memory kernel, and I'm creating number dppy dot uh, private dot array. Shape is simple one because you know it's a single register, and we are loading the data right memory of zero. We are loading that particular register with element, creating again a barrier. So you know the performs the computation to avoid the data race conditions, and we are multiplying um, each memory. Uh, item by two, right? Simple example of passing four elements and uh, this is the usage of the private memory. If you see in our offload to SQL device, private memory kernel and passing in the local, global and work group size, right? And
So this is run successfully and you know, yeah. Uh, so I told you, right? So the private memory is not working uh, on the dev cloud because you know, it requires newer version, but actually I can show you the already run version. I got a version that already run. which I exported as HTML. And if you see my last private memory sample, this is the wrong one, let me. Yeah, so this is a private memory sample that uh, run on the uh, Intel graphics and uh, we multiplied by two. So that's a basics of the usage of a shared local memory and private memory. And uh, let me go back to my dev cloud again and uh, go to the GPS, right? So GPS is nothing but, you know, histogram. It's a custom built algorithm. It's like creating a histogram, right? You got, you got a bin of items and, you know, you are actually based upon some criteria, you are actually selecting a set of points and you're allocating to the histogram. Uh, different. So there is a bin, there's a set of, around 30, 40 points uh, are being squared values that are passed to this algorithm and uh, millions of points and based upon the computation, which actually calculates the weight and pairwise uh, and the Euclidean distance in common. And based upon the value of that, it actually, you know, uh, diff you know settles different uh, histogram. It makes different histogram uh, bins, right? So Dean, I, I, I hate to interrupt because you're right on a flow, but we do have a question that is more up your alley than mine. Uh, there's a question about, um, uh, I'm not sure why there's a need to divide um, USM into work groups and to use barriers. Why doesn't random access of USM work in data parallel C++? It's in the chat. Let's see. If you want to mull on it for a while and keep going, I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it was within the context sure, yeah. this covered. Uh, we're not using USM here, but uh, uh, even using USM, you know, it's just that, you know, the, the thing we are trying to accomplish here is, right, uh, avoiding the global memory access and uh, increasing the latency of the global memory. So either using USM or, uh, uh, the regular uh, way of SQL programming, right? Uh, it's still, you know, if you want to have a better uh, optimization of your code, um, you know, especially if you're hitting a lot of L3 cache, you know, if you require a lot of locality, right? Uh, these are good options. I'm exactly not sure what random access of USM is, but, you know, I think, uh, I hope it clarified the question, but. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so GPA is right, I told you. Uh, so let's look at uh, uh, NAU GPA, right? I'm not doing anything in this. Uh, it's sim similar to what we did for K-means. Um, I got a set of points, dx, dy, dz, the uh, weights of the points. So this, there are some weights allocated, dx, dy, dz, and the weight of that point. And there is a R bin squared values, like to select a set of histogram points based upon some criteria, 40 points or, you know, and then we get the results, right? The result points that will be part of the histogram. So this is the logic, right? And uh, this is a very naive version, right? Um, what it's doing is it just uh, calling the Intel version two. Actually, we can actually go through the shared local memory implementation so that, you know, we can cover the naive version two at the same time. So I got multiple versions here in the same code here. If you see, I got a naive version here. Uh, I got a version two, version one is doing uh, atomic add. Uh, version two is also doing something equal, but you know, a, a small change in calculation. But the main thing we are doing is the shared local memory. This is not shared local memory, but this is the private memory, right? 
And we got a number of NBINs and we, the same data sets that we are passing. We're setting the private history size as 16 uh, and the local work group size of zero at 16 by 16. So it's a work group size we are setting as 16 by 16, which is 256. Each work group size we are splitting as 256. Intel, I think Intel GPU supports 256 the max. You can actually, you know, uh, start from 16, 32, 64. I think, you know, you can try out different, but 256 is the max that uh, <coughs> Gen 9 supports. Uh, we are actually running this on Gen 9. Right, and uh, let's look at the actual logic behind this uh, kernel, right? And um, I got this uh, code here, private memory implementation. And if I can calm down and uh, yeah, this is SLM. Think uh, one minute. Let me go to the lab folder, and there is uh, actual code here. Yeah, private. This is the one I'm actually looking at. So I'm calling the. Uh, No SLM kernel. Right? So here, what we'll do is we'll get the local ID, right? Local ID is the uh, index in the work group, right? Group ID is the what work group it belongs to, what is the number of that work group. And uh, this is for uh, the different dimensions, right? Local ID of zero and local ID of one. And uh, we are also getting the local size of the uh, both the dimensions, local uh, work group size of both the dimensions, right? And the weight is uh, mentioned as 20, right? DSQ calculation, uh, we are initializing a private uh, address space here, and uh, we are allocating 20 by 20. It's you know, two dimensions, like, you know, multiplying the matrix, like 400 elements, right? 20 into 20. And uh, W0 vector is uh, the weight of the uh, X point and W1 vector is the weight of the Y point and we are allocating the private space again. Offset is nothing but, you know, there is a way in GPU programming, you can actually, you know, get, if you like flatten the items, right? It's like a linear, calling it a linear ID of that element. So you're getting an offset of each element, right? It, it's a very famous programming, uh, parallel programming practice. So we are getting a linear ID of these elements, right? And uh, what we are doing is, the first one, right? Uh, now we are copying. If I, this loop actually, what it's doing is it's copying from the global memory to the private memory. If you see, this is the private memory that we allocated, right? And then we are computing the square distance of matrix of all these items. Uh, that's the Euclidean. The it's sort of a Euclidean distance, right? But the only uh, logic behind this GPS is because you know we got a set of uh, Arbin's value that we need to select and laid it as a histogram, right? So we are actually, you know, comparing sort of a, a condition, right? You know, uh, we're getting the uh, pairwise distance matrix here, calculating the pairwise distance matrix for each item. It's still in the private memory. And uh, uh, so this is happening for each work group, right? And then what we're doing is for, uh, take the each individual work group again, uh, after we compute the results, right, we have like, you know, uh, let's say we are 16 by 16, right? Let's say it's split into 16 work groups. I got now 16 work items, the 16 work groups with the uh, initial first item to have the actual uh, computed values of that. So, and then, you know, I'm actually creating a private history again, uh, you know, which is, as I mentioned, right, history of each work item, work group. And uh, now actually, you know, I'm performing the uh, actual pairwise, you know, I got the D DSQ uh, square uh, value. And um, if you see, I'm using the atomics here, right? This is a logic that actually identifies the bins that it actually belongs to for each private item, a private memory item that actually, you know, comes in. And then we're actually, you know, uh, finally, adding all the result vector, uh, each item 
is added to the result vector in parallel. So there is no data race condition, right? So I got uh, each of these elements are filled in into the each respective bin without any data race conditions. So this is the um, uh, usage using the private memory. And um, if I go to my, if I go back to my code, Let me go back. Yeah, I can run this sample. And actually, I, I got the VTune reports running in private and uh, also running in the naive way. So let me run this code and I'll actually walk you through the VTune reports of this. This is running, let me see if this is running. Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, Alfred Tang, I will actually circle back with you on this. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, make, we'll get you clarified on that. All right, so we ran the sample. Oh, I told you, right? So the private kernel breaks, but I got my notebook that I actually ran. I so this is the same. I updated a updated uh, using the latest Conda, ch uh, Conda channel and uh, impl you know install the latest version required for running the private memory. And um, I got it working here. So this is my private memory sample. Yeah, private, that is differential. This is private memory. Right, yeah. And if you see my results, they are for multiple, Calculations here. Uh, wait, what happened to my private memory? One minute. I thought I ran this sample, but uh, yeah, there you go. So uh, we're able to run the uh, private memory example, and uh, actually, you know, this. Let me see the chat. Let me go back and uh, I'll show you a differential version too. So it is my small change. The differential is it's not using atomics. We want to see how, how it behaves. The last version of updating the atomics code, right? Instead of atomics, we're just using the uh, regular way of uh, adding things. And that's a differential code. And uh, it's actually also in the same uh, lab folder. with those private differential. This is kernel, no kernel SLM, and uh, this is differential kernel. So everything remains the same, it's using the private array, and right? So all the computations are the same, but in the last, right? It's not calling the uh, atomic add, but what you see is it's calling the aggregated kernel here. I created, it's something like a reduction operation, right? What we do is you add the work group items, store it into your first uh, array of your work group, and then create another kernel and add all those values, right? Uh, of all the individual, we add it to the first element of the array, and we actually create another kernel, grab the first elements of, get the local ID zero, right? So it gives you the first element of that particular work group, right? And uh, you can actually, you know, uh, aggregate into uh, a different kernel. So it's a, different way of uh, doing things uh, instead of using atomics. That, that's the only difference between these two codes. So we just gave examples of them. And uh, yeah, 
So let's actually look at the uh, which one reports here. So this which one report and let me run this. So the first is the uh, naive version, right? And uh, it's a, I, I used a very small data size and I don't see anything. Z, zero GPU time is really zero. I'm not, you know, I'm just calling the random ND range kernel. Uh, it's a default, not doing anything special, just calling the ND range kernel with a very, I can actually see the number of points, right? This GPU out of 13 seconds, probably two seconds, right? And uh, uh, if you see, I got a big LP, it's bound by GPU L3 bandwidth bound 60%, right? Which is not good. And, you know, and if you utilize this, it's not bad, it's 18%. And if you see, I'm using just 65,000 items here, right? Uh, just to start with a new, new version. So now I started with the private memory with the same data, right? And uh, if you see, I got a better GPU time, which is 35%, still not good, but you know, it still says utilization is low, right? And um, the, uh, I think the workload is the same. This is a hotspots, right? So now I'm from two seconds, I'm from, you know, I, I'm better now with the GPU time, but you know, I'm still using the same, uh, this is still less, 16,000 items, right? With 16,000 items, I got much better uh, and even if you see the my GPU L3 bandwidth dropped down significantly from 68% uh, to 14%, right? Which is a very good uh, uh, benefit that we got using the uh, private memory. So I'm using 2 power 16 now, which is, you know, uh, almost 2 power 16. Sorry for the number, 65,000 again. And now I got a much better, so I got 85% I'm spending on GPU, right? And it's showing all the hotspots, top hotspots when GPU was idle. And it shows what is the hottest computing task, which is, you know, this is my main function, kernel that I'm, that's offloaded to the device, right? And if you go to the private memory with two power 16 items, uh, I got much better GPU time occupancy here and very less EU array stall idle, which is also very good. My GPU L3 bandwidth is high significantly improved. Right now I got only 14%, right? Compared to 60s, 70s without using the private memory. And my FPU utilization is a little bit bad, 63, but you know, uh, there's something that needs to be worked on, but uh, yeah, so it gives you the, all the information on the device it ran on and, you know, so yeah, just, you know, uh, just play around changing the numbers and, you know, uh, what uh, we observed is the differential uh, ran much. Uh, I couldn't run the differential because, you know, the dev cloud was not working by the time I was taking that, as I mentioned, right, it was in maintenance and uh, I couldn't take the uh, differential we tune report for differential, but I what my our understanding is, I think that is much little bit better than compared to the uh, atomics version that we used. Right. Uh, any questions I can answer in GPAs? I think that's what we covered in GPAs. And the last thing I want to cover is the scikit learn version of k-means, which should not take much time, but I'll see if I got any questions that I can answer here. Memory of Bell. Yeah, yeah, we'll for sure investigate. Uh, uh, I'll get in touch with our and we'll see. What we also, what I will do is uh, I'll quickly run through the. k-means using scikit-learn, which is a very small, uh, decent size module, but you know, uh, but you got a whole big course on uh, uh, scikit-learn, which, you know, which actually is very, will be very helpful. 
to k-means and sk. So this is patching k-means, right? It's the same k-means that we did using dpex, number dpex. And we are using the k-means uh, using the scikit plant here. So I talked about, I clearly detailed about uh, how you actually apply your uh, patching here from sklearn import, patch sklearn, right? And from sklearn import k-means, all the deep, uh, the text is clearly mentioned. We talked about what k-means algorithm is, right? So the simple exercise here is just apply the uh, patching algorithm and run the sample and plot it. So actually the, uh, there are multiple lots of practicums in this course in scikit-learn that, you know, uh, actually it's also, uh, uh, it's also in, in the, uh, it's not, I think it's not published on the, uh, GitHub yet, but uh, I think it will be for sure. So, but so it's it's, it's the, this one, right? So it's a simple from SQL learn import data sets from SQL learn import patch SQL right? So we are patching the we are applying the patch here just after the compute fit product, right? And I'm instantiating k-means. Number of centroids is very less three. I'm loading the iris data set, right? And initializing the k-means with the random init with random and the number of centroid plus three. And actually, you know, I'm loading the labels uh, after, you know, calling the fit predict, I'm getting the labels, right? So this is the general uh, simple thing we do, right? And uh, we are actually writing the cluster centers for just for, you know, uh, plotting this, we are writing this to a uh, CSV file. And after the, uh, after that, you know, we are just reading the CSV file and uh, we are uh, running, you know, loading the data, loading the uh, plot, uh, plotting the data. If you see here, I got a message that Intel Extras for Circuit Learning is enabled, and uh, you know, you can actually unpatch it and you know see the time it takes uh, for running this same example. This is, I think, probably not a big data set, but. You can try out with the uh, huge data sets and see, you know, uh, the advantage that you can take uh, compared to the stock circuit learn. And uh, yeah, this is the unpatching. Uh, also, unpatching code is also given in this. So you can actually, you know, apply the unpatch and try and uh, see. Let me actually, Bob does, un uh, yeah, let me run this. And Yeah, something is broke here, but uh, I think the unpatch should also work here. What is this? Best uh, don't remove the line. I'm just here. Name unpatch is not defined. Yeah, I think something broke on the the cloud, but you know this should be a uh, uh, also a very easy example to run on. So this is using intellections for scikit learn and. Uh, uh, we also talked about the number DPEX. With that right, let me actually uh, share my summary slide and we can wrap it up. So, all right, so we did the, you know, uh, so we did the hands-on walking through of all the code snippets uh, of all the, for the algorithms, k-means and gpays. And uh, we also talked about one API and all the AI analytics toolkit. Thank you very much for attending the session and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are, we still got 10 minutes and we can answer any questions that you got, uh, that we can take here.